Here's my question again, Karen. <laughs> All right, so you're the, I always get it confused, the difference between a set decorator and a set designer, because you are a set decorator. Yes. Yes. And everybody who doesn't do this does that. And they even add in set director, which doesn't exist. It well, doesn't exist? There's no such thing as a set director. There is an art director. There's an art director, and there's an assistant director. And there's a director, but there's no set director. And there's a director of photography. And there's director of photography. <laughs> uh, a set designer is the person who draws the walls. The, the set designer, if they were designing the space, would draw the rectangular walls and they'd draw the um, pilasters and they would call out like the molding on the floor and they might even call out um, some versions of film, they might call out, like they'd do a ceiling plan and they'd show where the lights are on the ceiling and the windows and the doors and all that. The set decorator fills the space, so. Perfect. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's super easy. Like, they hand me a set painted with floors, uh, with all the molding, with all the hardware, and I fill it, whether it's, whether it's a hospital or a mansion, or a hovel, or even if it's a cardboard box. Although, when you get down to doing like homeless encampments and things, there's not so much set quote design as decoration. So if someone was living, if we were doing a set and someone living next to a shopping cart with uh, a tarp tied over, that's all set decoration. Although the set designer might call out that it's a shopping cart with a tarp tied over. So, and there are, lot, there are a lot of gray areas. There are a lot of gray areas, but that's pretty definite. That's pretty definite. Because yeah. this is the same, well, it's not the same like interior designer versus decorator. Because no. designers are schooled, they have, they technically have gone and have, have a degree in it yeah. versus a decorator is someone who has a great eye. Well, assume, presumably they both do have well, a great a eye. A lot of them do. <laughs> a lot of them do. And then they just work as a decorator. But this is a very yeah. different distinction in terms of all the roles of people on set. And in interior design, sometimes you get people who actually are telling the architect we need to move the wall here or the, even more the engineer mm -hmm. you know like we need to move the wall here and the engineer is saying like you can't do that because the house will fall down and in set decoration there is no such issue sometimes in set design some things have to be built a certain way to facilitate either you know some technical thing for filming it or just the size of it or whatever or the money most, most likely the money the money is the biggest thing so how does a girl from Virginia come to LA <laughs> and become a set decorator? <laughs> um, you have to be, I, I was that kid in high school who, when everybody else was at, hanging out with other kids, I was sitting in the library looking at books of furniture because I always loved furniture and I always loved like the historical houses that were all around me. I didn't grow up in one, but, um, and I loved art. And I came to UCLA and I got a degree in art history. And most importantly, I was super, super, super lucky because I worked on a thousand student films at UCLA. And I didn't, like, almost everybody I worked with at UCLA had like some story. They, Almost everybody wanted to be a director, either a director or a producer or a cinematographer. And I didn't, you know, I never wanted to direct. And they always needed somebody who was happy to paint the sets. And I was happy to paint the sets. And uh, then it got really fun to like try, start to try find, start to try to find the costumes. and. 
I was making costumes. And I actually, I always loved sewing and I always loved costume and I thought I kind of want to do that, but I really didn't have, I don't have what it takes to deal with the human side of it. You have to be, you know, to be a costume designer, you're kind of like the actor's therapist and I don't, no, no, it's totally true. It's totally true and I just don't have that, you know, the actors. Because you're just constantly on them, you're their constantly physical body. On them and besides being able to do what you do, you have to hold their hand because, you know, you have people who are freaking out because they've gained five pounds or they are so into their head about their role that they're, you know, dismissive of every human being around them. And, and that's just their process, you know, or they're worried that they're looking older and they're freaking that out. That never happens to any of us. That never <laughs> happens to any actors, let's say. And or or layman's. <laughs> yeah, and there are a lot of amazing, amazing, amazing people doing that. But I just, you know, I worked on one show as a friend's assistant. She was doing a non-union show. And she didn't have anybody to work with her. And so I was very happy to go work with her. And I realized I don't have the right personality to do this. And I do, I love decorating. I love all the details. But I, I was super lucky because... A friend at UCLA Film School, their mom was a production manager, so that means she could hire the production assistants. And she, Lynn Morgan, was uh, so generous and kind that she kept hiring me till I became competent enough that I could get hired without a family friend. So this is when you were still in school? No, this is like when I was right out of school, like when I was 22, 23. And so what, after I was out of school. What, when you went for art history, what did you think you would do with that? Um, I did art history because I've always loved art. And I kind of realized while I was still in school that I, it, the world of art history was like narrowing and narrowing and narrowing. I mean... When I was in school, the government funding for art was just clamping down and getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And basically everybody knew by the time I graduated that if you wanted to be in art history, you had to get a PhD. And that's, um, you know, our friend Mark has a PhD in art history and he's really a chemist. And he works in, you know, all those, all those people, they, they would have had to spend, you know, eight or ten more years in school and and however much that cost to go work for fifty thousand dollars a year and you know money isn't my only motivator but I just um, I didn't have the energy to do it at that time and film was just getting too interesting to me yeah which is so and also there's the whole I don't know if you feel like explaining this but you have to get you have to work to get into the union because we and yeah. so this person, Lynn, was able to give you work, and did that facilitate you getting enough experience to get no, into the union, like or that's a whole step. other step? That was a whole other step. And, um, but she got me to the point where I could meet people who could get me in. And I, you know, I worked as a production assistant and then an art production assistant. And actually, she gave me a job as a craft service person on a made-for-TV movie, and that's how I actually got my first. Which one? Which movie? Oh, uh, <laughs> oh shoot! Oh my God! It was um, it was a made-for-TV movie about the McMartin. It was a fictionalized version of the McMartin preschool child abuse case. It was like a fictionalized version of that. But I was out there with like my little espresso machine, making espresso <laughs> at midnight for the DP. But what I did, I she, you know, she was very smart. She, she very pointed. She was like, but besides the fact that she stood there with me once and she said, "I want you to look around," and I'm like, "Okay." She says, "You know, I think I was like 24." She looked like 24. When I was your age and I was working on sets, I looked around and I saw a smorgasbord and I'm like, what? 
and she goes, look at all these men. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but um, you're like, oh yeah, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot to look at. But, um, that's good advice from a mentor, or was it? <laughs> it was uh, when I because was did your was good dating pool then consist completely of people in the uh, on set in the industry in that um, way? Yeah, I guess so, because everybody I knew, even everybody I knew when I wasn't working, so at that age, you know, I could work for a month or two months and live for three months off of that. And, and there, were, there were those kinds of gaps yeah. in time because you have to find the next job and it's, you're getting established and you don't have like people you go from job to job to job with. And... Uh, but I was, you know, I knew tons of people my age, and we were doing free projects in between. So yeah, kind of. And it, even at that point, it was like, you know, what do you mean you're working 60 hours a week? What's wrong with you? You know, it's like... You were, you were putting in that kind of time. Oh, for sure, yeah. And was this jumping from craft services? You, well, you started in film first, right? That was your first love to work? Well, no, craft services, a job on film. That's the coffee person. Right, so, no, yeah. oh, yes, but I mean in terms of transitioning that back to well, no, so set decoration. And we should explain my, craft services as is the catering. The, the, the vegetable platter and the coffee and the water and the And the sodas, donuts and the, and the, and the donuts Twizzlers. And the Twizzlers are super <laughs> important. You will always be asked for Twizzlers on yeah. the film side if you do craft services. Yes, I've done. But no, things. I was carrying uh, like a bag of a 50 pound bag of ice over one shoulder and like four folding chairs in the other hand and I had been bugging the set decorator who was awesome her name is Lisa Smithline and she's out of the business now but she's she was awesome she's just you know I don't know she's only like five years older than me but she, she just seemed like she had everything so much more together and she just kind of kicked ass and I've been saying I want to do what you do I want to do what you do I want you to hire me as a grunt and she's like nice 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 that's nice that's nice and she saw me she literally said she said I saw you with a bag of ice over one shoulder <laughs> and a bunch of folding chairs in the other arm and I knew you could pick up the couch I'm like yes I can pick up the couch <laughs> yes you can and she hired <laughs> me to be just grunt labor on the, the next thing she did that she needed uh an army of people and and after a couple days of grunt labor she gave me like a hundred bucks and she sent me to Staples and said I need whatever goes on top of this desk and I was like okay tape you know post-its pens and I went to Staples and I did okay and uh, and then we were doing a made-for-tv movie called The Big One about an earthquake and she we were doing the back lot I don't remember I don't remember if it was Warner Brothers or Universal it was one of those but we had to do all these store windows and like cars were going to crash through the windows it was going to be super exciting but so we couldn't rent rent things to go in the windows we had to have things that could be uh, destroyed Smash. So I was out buying, there was like a bridal shop and a car was going to crash through the window. So I was out at thrift shops buying wedding dresses to put on mannequins so cars could crash through the windows. <laughs> but it was super it's fun. It's never it. dull. Well, and I'm noticing... It's dull sometimes. But <laughs> it's dull. It we'll fun. come back to that. Because there are illusions about all kinds of things related to the industry. But okay. one of the things that I'm noticing in your story that I know people talk about a lot today and I don't know if you witness it with new people coming in you're just the kind of person I was one of those people too where you get in and you do the work and you oh, yeah. you if someone asks you to do something and you're willing to do it yeah. you're willing to carry lug yeah. and haul you're willing to clean the toilets you're just yeah. like I'm here I want to work I want to learn I know where I'm going and I'm going to do it and yeah. the theory today is that a lot of younger people are coming in they don't have that same kind of 
But is that even accurate you know to say? They don't have like that, I'm just going to grab it and get it. Instead, it's like, well, I should already be directing this. Or is no, that not fair? I, Stereotype. You know I would say that I think when I was 23 or 24 or 25 and trying to work as hard as I could and learn as much as I could, and, you know, it took a second for that to kick in. I mean, you know, it was, I need to just get on it and get going. And it, you never know who's going to get you your next job. You, and you can never just say this person is a complete and utter waste of oxygen and, and not, you know, get along with them because it seems like they make your job harder because you don't know who's dad they know or whatever. But um, I think there were just as many people back then. And I, I, I don't think film has a lot of people, you know. I mean, when I was in my 20s, I knew people who thought they should be production designing and getting coffee was below them. But there are also five, five times as many people who are like, Yes, because when I get you coffee, I get to stand next to you and talk to you for 30 seconds, mm -hmm. you know, and I might be able to learn something from you. So, I don't know, I am always seeing people now who blow me away, you know, we have a kid on the show I'm working on, I don't know, he can't be 27 even, and he hasn't gotten the opportunity to get in the union to do what he does, but I'm like, this kid just is on it and he is so hard working and there are a lot of those out there sometimes That's it takes good. a second for people to learn that you yeah. know i mean well i think that this industry entertainment would would not tolerate it maybe as yeah, much because you know, you there's so many people that want to do it there are there are a lot that, that want to do that that want to design do and decoration and there are always people you hear about you know so and so hires their kid all the time so and so got their kid into the union and they hire their kid all the time and don't ever hire their kid because they have never had to work hard, they've never had to figure anything out themselves, and uh, you don't want them on your crew because you're gonna have to take up the slack for them. But there have always been that, you know. So it's really a combination. It's, it's a combination. But it's, it is the kind of thing that helps you move forward when you're yeah. willing to be there and show yeah. up and uh, yeah. work hard and yeah. be available for people and just by your story. And, and always be on time and don't show up to work drunk. And <laughs> 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 All those simple bits All of those advice are very jail. valuable. <laughs> I, had, I had someone I loved to work with, but he kept accidentally ending up in jail. It just <laughs> became problematic. It was like, I love you, but... <laughs> I need you to not be in jail, you know. Well, and you were saying to, I think that was wise that you were able to recognize that you weren't the personality to be on the costume side. Yeah, totally. But you are for the set decoration, and you are, I comment this because we know each other, but I, you're so great as a team player, whereas many of us who freelance are individual, and we get to sort of do everything our way, but you have to have a personality that, like you well, said, is like stays open and blends and is on the team. That's been my biggest learning experience in this whole business because I want to sit alone in a room and not talk to anyone. That's my dream. Really? Well, <laughs> I like. I like um, Are you an introvert, extrovert? <laughs> I, I like. I love going out and finding things. I love digging around warehouses and I love, you know, spending all morning finding the right fabric and then getting it to the, the upholsterer and finding this awesome just piece of garbage, piece of furniture that I know has great bones to the, to, you know, the guy who's going to recover it and, and working with them to do things. But it's really exhausting to like if I'm dressing, you know, four sets in a day, to have to deal with all the people who are asking me questions. Yeah, I don't know and how you do it. <laughs> it's it's really exhausting, and and 
people always wonder why I come home and I shut the doors and I you want to stare at the wall and I want to stare at the wall yeah. <laughs> and, and 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 even then the cats are too demanding <laughs> I love you but I just can't pick you up right now you know, here's your food leave me alone but I want to come back to the part where you said sometimes it is dull because I, well, it is exciting from the outside, and it is. I mean, it's like an incredibly creative process. But I'm wondering what is an illusion to someone that says, oh, you're working on film and TV all the time. What do people not understand about that kind of work? Even for me, they're sitting and waiting. Um, the hurry up and wait. Yeah, the hurry up and wait, and I have, a lot more hurry up and a lot less weight than people in most other jobs. Like people, people on the crew have so much weight. Um, you know, the grips they get the, their flag set, and then they wait while they do the thirteen takes or whatever. And then if the camera moves, they adjust the lights and stuff. But they sit there and they wait. And that's why, you know, like... This is where knitting comes in handy. <laughs> uh, some people knit. I know so many people who play Words with Friends. I mean, like, I worked on a show that the key grip was playing Words with Friends with, like, ten people. And uh, there was a point when, like, half of the crew was... What were those? Um, not Farmville, but what? The, ma the Mafia one? The Mafia game before that? I have I don't know, never a, been there pulled a, in. There was a Facebook mafia <laughs> game, and I was like on so many people's crew because they just needed bodies, and I was like, do I have to play? What is this? <laughs> They're like, no, 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 we just need you on our crew, and everyone's not get the random emails. It's weird. But, um, uh, yeah, the, the, there's the hurry up and wait. And for, and for me, like the budget stuff, and that's like before I get to do anything, I have to figure out what it's going to cost and the, the, um, the kind of hammering it out with producers about this is why this costs this and here are 14 you know, examples of this at this price and that's, that's the hardest thing for me and so that's not fun. A lot of research on your a part. A lot of research and sometimes dealing with people who are like well this is what I have and I'm like this is what the money you're saying you have will get you. And then there are people who will say, you have to make it work. And I'm like, you know, and it's really hard because you're like, you can be called like not a team player or hard to work with. And then there are producers who are just like, I get it, I understand. Um, you know, do as well as you can. Or there are producers who go to the writers and say, this thing you want to do that requires a custom sofa for the people to be sitting like this costs this and we can't do it but you know that's that's my my metric of a producer who's good a, pr a producer who will go to the writers and say we can't afford to do what you wrote and not all of them will some of them will a lot of them will but some of them are just like they're kind of like holding a tiger by the tail and if they let go it's going to turn around and bite them and they won't they shouldn't have grabbed that tiger <laughs> you know? yeah you know well and then on that on the flip side of that because i know i you started doing a lot of films and you were on some very would you call them big budget yeah, films? Yeah, I was on some big budget films. And was that like on the on the exciting part of it? That because was super, it is exciting. It's it you know what? It's super fun to go to the Pacific Design Center and find these gorgeous fabrics that are being shipped in from Italy and but that I was an assistant on that, so I didn't have to deal with the producer about the money. So I would go to my boss and say, this gorgeous fabric is $140 a yard, wholesale, which is what... And what film was this one? Oh, tons of films. Tons of them, but what's the one that comes to um, mind? The last big film I did, I worked with a designer, a decorator, 
his name is Jim Erickson, and he's brilliant, he's retired now, but he's really, really great. And uh, we did Muhammad Ali's life, it was Ali. We this Muhammad. is the Will Smith. This is the Will Smith one, which opened the same week as like Lord of the Rings or something it like did. that. <laughs> it did, and it just got totally blown away. And I don't know, I, I saw it again lately, and it was still, it was, it looks really it beautifully art directed. It was. John Meyer was a designer, and he's a huge designer, and he was really nice, very talented. And it went, it was here, it was in Chicago, we shot a little bit in New York, and we did all the Africa stuff in Mozambique, because at that time, in, two, in the year 2000, Mozambique was a good place to shoot Africa. And it and that changes all the time because of political stuff. Well, and this is this is a little bit of a segue um, into this idea that while you were doing all of this as your twenty something or early thirty something self, you weren't a mom yet. And with film, you can go and travel right well, at the drop of a hat. And or I didn't travel. Well, that was kind of I mean my whole film career like that was the history of me, and I remember them all vividly, like the phone call. I would love to go do your movie in Hawaii, but I'm trying to get pregnant. <laughs> or I would love to go be your assistant in the beautiful Pacific Northwest, but I just bought a house and moved in with my boyfriend. Or I'm getting married next month, and, and just all those times where I, you know, it's like a, a flow chart. Like I took the route that went that way, and other things went the other direction. And I'm, I'm just slowly, like, when my son was three, I finally got my card to be the union decorator rather than assistant. And I was so lucky because the first interview I worked. I walked into, I got the job, and it was on a kid's sitcom, and kid shows have slightly more reasonable hours because they, the kids have restricted filming hours, and being a sitcom, it was a multi-camera show, so they shot all the different camera angles at once, so that shortens the shooting day, and it was, it was like I had a fairy godmother looking after me because, you know, a for 14 different things. A friend of mine was walking out of the interview as I was walking in, and we didn't know that both of us were interviewing for the same job. And she turned around and she said to my prospective boss, who I then worked for for 10 years, she turned around and said to him, if you don't hire me, hire her. And another That's friend nice. who I would known from film was working for this guy on another show and he happened to walk through the office and he walked in and he said hire her mm. it was it was it was like just a confluence of so many good forces and it was the best job i could have had when i had a three-year-old and then a four-year-old and then a five-year-old well and were you already separated from your husband were you being a single mom at that time the or? first day working on that job was it, it was all in process. Then the first day working on that job was my first day of couples therapy with my husband. <laughs> <laughs> well, and what is we talked about this before? This, I mean, just to be first of all, you're freelance, which everyone who watches this or is part of this, you know, we're all yeah. we're, uncertainty is yeah. part of our livelihood. Yeah. You have and to be able to deal with it. You have to be able to deal with it. And then on top of it, to be reliant upon an industry that does not, um, and correct me if any of this is wrong, but it doesn't sound like from when I've heard people talk, it doesn't favor you know, motherhood or no. a, like a domestic existence or you no. started to talk about or working. Or balance. Yes, you started to talk about 60-hour... 60 hours is, is just basic. 
average. It's just average. And how you're even able to and was that the was that the Disney show that were you on Disney for that first one? Was that the Miley Cyrus was, one or I was on Hannah Montana for the first two seasons and then uh, there was a writer strike that was really rough. It was like five months and the shooting schedules got all changed around because I was going to go do another show in the hiatus for Hannah and then come back to Hannah. But what happened was they all came back at the same time. So I went and did the other show, which it lasted three years. There were only two more years of Hannah. It lasted three years. And, and it was kind of, it was really fun to do the first two seasons of Hannah because we got to kind of flesh out different things. And then the other show was really fun because it was a set on a cruise ship that went around the world. So I got to do Morocco and Antarctica and Japan and all these, you know, crazy things we did. India. So that was really fun. You know, it was like doing these little contained areas because um, sitcom sets are very contained. They're really theater sets. If you look at uh, if you look at stuff like back at I Love Lucy, um, back in that era, it's three walls and the cameras are along the fourth wall. So it's not like a camera can follow somebody through a door. Right, it's all set up. Sort it's all of set like up how we even have this. Just kind of, uh, move in and move out and maybe go left to right a little bit but the whole thing is static and that makes those shows easier to shoot and they get all the camera angles at once almost sometimes they'll go and that's where you're saying it goes faster it so goes you're not faster. what would you so with a three or four year old though how many hours were or your week, so is it, does it cut it down to 40, just your basic no, full time, or no? No, it didn't cut it down to 40, and... It's still more than that. It's still, oh, it's definitely still more than that, and, but I was able, I mean, thank God for the internet, because I, I could sit at home at night, and back then, not all the prop houses were as well integrated with the internet as they are now, I mean, and it's not perfect yet, but... There, every time you turn around, somebody who's been in business forever has finally gotten their website up. But not all of them do still. But um, but I could sit at home at night and do research. I could, uh, you know, try to find uh, whatever, you know, whatever weird thing that I needed 40 of while he was watching whatever he watched <laughs> when he was five years old. Uh, um, That's right. It's not the the hours it's don't not, encompass you being on set. It correct, is you. Correct. You're we're in Los Angeles. You know the city upside down because a huge portion Mostly, so is finding, finding things. things. I find things. And now the internet. So set decorator equals finding things. Finding <laughs> making things, things and getting things picked up and getting things picked up at the right time and. And making things work together, making things you didn't order a chair on the internet that turns out to be that tall. That happened to you? <laughs> Not a chair. But, but you know. Uh, you have to think on your feet. You have to think on your feet. You have to think about all the things that could go wrong. Like, Right now, I bought, I spent 20 minutes with my boss. We're recreating And you're this. on a YouTube series now. No. No. I'm on a series for Facebook. I guess it's the a first. A series for Facebook. The first original scripted show for Seriously? Facebook. Seriously? Wow. And you can see, like, the first couple episodes of it are already airing, of last season. So MTV did it last season. And then, I'm not sure what the timeline of how it happened was. But MTV canceled the show, and they threw out all the set dressing and the walls that were built. And then they let the comedian whose show it is take it to another network, which is cool, but it would have been cooler if they kept all the stuff. So we're trying to, we're trying to recreate the sets because things that they did last season really worked. And there's this... Just, 
dumb light that I saw the one they used. The one they used was actually in a prop house, and my boss who did this, the show last year, she said, I like it, but I don't love it. See if you can find something better. Yeah. And uh, so I'm looking online and all the, it, it's a light that goes over a pool table, one of those big, long, like fake Tiffany billiard table lights. And she and I spent 20 minutes looking at pictures of what Amazon has and trying to buy, not to rent, because in the end it's cheaper to buy. And we settled on one that is in Ontario, and some dude in Ontario, I bought it on eBay from some dude on, in Ontario. So you're leaving here to go get it. No. <laughs> no. No. He, um, first he asked me if he could refund the money and have me pay in person in cash. And that didn't set up red flags, and I realized eBay doesn't let you do that because they get their cut. And then I've been you know, messaging him back saying, yeah, I can do that. But I wonder if they, if someone shut down his thing? I don't know. Yes, so sometimes they're monitoring all of that. They're monitoring. So you have no light is what you're saying. So I have no light and I've been thinking, <laughs> I've got to go to Ikea. <laughs> but I keep, I'm like, I need to find an alternate light. And I have the light they used last season tagged at Sony Prop House. But I don't love it. And I really like the one I found in Ontario. Well, explain that for just a quick second. But so there are also some items you're buying, some items you're renting from a prop house. Yeah. So there are house houses, building structures that have all kinds of things that people rent specifically for sets. Yeah, and, and or you can film or you could probably go in there if you knew what you're doing and rent it for a party or if you're a party planner or whatever. But there are giant warehouses. All the big, well, all the big studios used to have them. I mean, Paramount had it, Fox had it, but they got rid of theirs. Sony has a warehouse on Slauson. Warner Brothers is on the Warner Brothers lot. Universal's on the Universal lot. And then there are a lot of private people like, uh, you know, in the 70s, someone who was a set decorator started Omega, which is kind of the biggest and the best organized. They might not have the most items, but their items are best taken care of. And uh, there's one called Objects that everything in there is the most gorgeous piece of decorator furniture that you ever wanted. And there's one called Nest. And the woman who started that did commercials and she totally gets it that you need the option of renting every Pottery Barn or CB2 or uh, Urban Outfitters, Guga that ever went on a shelf, and then a good classic range of contemporary, really clean, doesn't have any foot step marks or tears in its sofas for commercials. She was a commercial decorator, so she gets what they need for commercials. And everything's super neutral, but kind of like high end and nice. And it's, it's like it's. I know it's your everyday world, but it's mind blowing. Oh, I'll take how you much? Someday. Yes, I'm I'll hoping I will get to do some filming there. Okay. I. It's mind blowing how much goes into one creation on film or television. Oh, yes. And living here and having friends who are part of the industry and having been on set a few times. You, I can't look at anything anymore without having appreciation, especially when it's pulled together so seamlessly and beautifully. And I think about yes. all the things. I know. And I think about, sometimes I want to take a picture of it and it, the color scheme is so spot on. I want to make a painting from it. But I just think about all the people that it takes to make that happen. Well, so, okay. And anyway, I, it's, I have a space. lot of awe for it all. And think about your impressed. space. So, you remember when you first saw Empty, right? So that's what I get. Yeah. And, and that's got to be always, like, such an exciting part. Or it depends. It's scary at that point. It's scary at that point. It's not exciting yet. It's exciting when it comes together. When you're standing there and the camera's rolling and somebody turns to you and is like, "This is good. This this works." And you're like, "Oh my god." Yeah. <laughs> but but no. But think about it because you know you have these chairs and you have that stool. And if I was if we were shooting 
someone who's doing like a webisode, we get have to get all those cameras. We would have to get all the chargers, and my guys might have to put in like oh yeah, the they were filming outlets. us filming this. If they were filming us, and we have to get like a paint paintings by a painter who's doing the <laughs> interviews. So we have to decide what her paintings look like, and we have to get a whole bunch of them. And then her uh, her friend who she works with, who shares a space with her, we have to get different paintings by her. And then we have like. Uh, you know, obviously she got some Ikea stuff, and then, you know, oh, what'd she do to the ceiling? So, first there are the fluorescent fixtures on the ceiling, and then there are the cool, the cool fabric drape you've got. I mean, like, my thing is, I just, I can't help myself when I, you were setting up. I'm like, how many yards is, is that like 35 yards <laughs> the ceiling? And I couldn't stop myself. And in everything down to the little refrigerator, down to, you know, yeah. not everything can be all new, and and down to the gorgeous drop cloth on the floor, that's it's OT's drop cloth, Yeah. and and the paint cans. And that's and years of paint put on there. And you would have paint. to create that potential and, and layer. And you have to have it. all those layers of real life, or else nobody believes it. Or you look at it, and it's like, oh, it looks like they went to Cos Plus yeah. in two hours about that like set, a, and it doesn't look real like houses that get renovated without thought where they're just well, going to like, home there's no history although that it could be a look too that's totally <laughs> a look but if if i did that on a set that's part of the story like you know that's a story that's like someone's wife kicked them out and they have enough money to go to living spaces and slap down the credit card and they got to have enough money to go to living spaces and slap down the credit card. And everything looks like it came from living spaces yesterday. Mm -hmm. And they went to Bed Bath & Beyond about everything new. But in real life, you know, you think about it, you know, I have my three-year-old duvet cover on my bed. And I have sheets that I love that are so faded that because I've had them on my bed forever. And I have a chair that I've had for 20 years in my bedroom and you know photos and, uh, and, 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 family. and photos of my family and my little collection All of mirrors of detail. and my blinds that are shredded by the cats and, <laughs> and you have to shred some blinds so yeah it's true sure. no it's so true it just, but it would but, make um, you see detail like to the nth degree on everything right your eye is just trained that way now. every single creative person I work with in my departments we always have these weird pictures of like and and we show them to each other it's like look at this paint trip and you're like oh my god that's the most <laughs> awesome thing or look at this like things that you would never believe exist in real life and like you can't do this in film because people say that would never happen and you walk into the real world and you see the weirdest craziest things and you're just like who does that and it's like <laughs> i want to meet who does that because they are fascinating <laughs> and you have to draw a line because on set sometimes if you do something that's that crazy, it will draw the attention away from the story. And what I'm really doing is I'm telling the backstory. Mm -hmm. And I'm supporting the story. Unless, you know, there are weird things where my story is supposed to be jarringly different than the words that people are speaking, right? So they're saying one thing and the story I'm telling tells a different story, but that's the whole point. You know, my story's revealing the true story. So no, I'll take you, we should go, and, and the fun thing is, they're all so different. I should. One day, make some time, and the bummers, we can't do it on the weekend. Make some time, and I'll take you to a bunch of different prop houses, because there's yeah. one. And it'll be fun to show everyone. Yeah, there's <laughs> one in Sun Valley. We get permission. Okay. There's one in Sun Valley um, that they got a lot of their stuff from uh, the Hallmark like mini series and stuff and they have so much western stuff and they also have like a bunch of the stuff from Pirates of the Caribbean so if you ever need like medieval or, or pirate stuff they have that and then you know there's one called Tech Props that it's all scientific stuff 
or slightly medical. And there's alpha that's all medical, and they also have some alpha stuff. And they're, I take him to, to some of the art ones that are all art, and there's yeah. some that are like broad, general, everything. Like supposedly you can get everything that goes in the house from a refrigerator to uh, a sofa to a painting. But they're all like super different, and they all have a different focus, and they kind of, they kind of all um, reflect the owner's vision or interest, you know. It's very rich with inspiration. And it's very rich with inspiration, but I also, you know, like Paramount and Disney and Fox all decided that their on-lot real estate was more valuable as something else, offices or whatever, and, you know, a lot of my personal hard drive is filled up with, like, I still know, like, every restaurant table light that they had in multiples at Disney, <laughs> and it's still filling up my brain, and I still think about the stuff in the Paramount it's basement. It's really great basement. to know set decorators have them as your friend and your neighbor, because <laughs> they have answers to all questions. <laughs> they have solutions for everything. <laughs> Potentially, potentially, we're just yeah. suggesting that, but not everybody if, gets to have that. If you want to know where to get curtain fabric, the answer is yes. But. Well, when you was film your, I know, again, this can just be a stereotype, right? But there's this difference between film and TV, and now it's all blending together because now there's Facebook and YouTube yeah. and Netflix, and so it really is. I would think it really doesn't matter. It's, you know, A, it's about getting work to support yeah. yourself, and, and B, it's about the project could be anything. It doesn't just need to be film. Or is that still the ideal to work on a bigger budget film? Or what is, what's well, your favorite? Or is there one? When, when I was in my 20s, everybody's goal, everybody that I knew, the goal was to go work on big films because they had the big budgets and probably more importantly they had really good amounts of prep time oh. so because you can do good fast that. and cheap mm -hmm. and you can only do two of those at the most you can't have good fast and cheap so tv always had a lower budget and so you could do good and cheap but you couldn't do good fast and cheap but now and they also have, you know, film always had more imaginative stories, which kind of still, there are a lot more imaginative stories, but, and, you know, I worked on things that were like superhero movies. I, I worked on a lot of things that it was a bigger art idea. It wasn't just creating reality. But now there's tons of great stuff on TV that's like that. Right, there's or these series on Netflix yeah. as an and example. Yeah, and there's so heightened reality. The quality or, the, or Game of well, Thrones. I mean, like imagine like Game of Thrones, that world that but, people are creating. But that's still the situation where that Game of Thrones, you know, 30 years ago, they, they might have shot it here. They probably would have still shot it in England, but if it wasn't so like European centric, they would have shown it here. And all those jobs were here, but so many tax incentives have sprung into existence to, you know, people are building studios. There's studios in Atlanta now, yes. and there's studios on the East Coast and, and New Canada York. Canada too, right? There's Canada, a lot of tons stuff. of TV went to Canada. There are a lot of sitcoms in Canada. Well, so then how does, how do you do that as a parent? Like, how does anyone as a parent or someone with a family, you know, how do they, I don't want to say well, make it in the industry, but continue to expand within it without, how do they, how do you find that balance? You, do you? you have to keep learning. Like, when I started my first sitcom as a decorator, I had never worked on a sitcom in any capacity ever before. And... Was this the kids' show? The yeah, first time? Okay. yeah, and and there were some things to learn. A lot of it was the same, but there were some definite things to learn. And um, 
never put anything up high. Like in features, you know, I remember spending days being the assistant who got to go and like practically hang from the rafters at the Warner Brothers lighting warehouse and measure chandeliers. And you, ne you almost never do that stuff on a sitcom because they have so many, uh, it's all lit from above where in features they more light from below. And if you, if you know what you're looking at, if you look at the lighting, you can tell. And they move the lights around. And, and in sitcoms, they kind of move the cameras more and the lights stay stationary up above. It's like theater. Mm -hmm. And um, so you never hang a chandelier from above. And the sound is always mic'd from above on sitcoms, so you can't put anything up there that's going to get in the way of the booms or the sounding. <laughs> yeah, grumpy. But um, but uh, so you just you just have to keep learning, and and the world is constantly changing, and and I feel super lucky. Really pliable, like just yeah, you have to be pliable. You can't say I do this, and that's all I'm gonna do. And you know, I know a lot of people. A lot of people my age have spent their lives. Um, going to other cities like my deal was I wanted to stay in town and try to have a family and a home and a life and that made me go work in TV and not keep working in features because all these big features are leaving and even now, even now like a lot of the the really amazing one hours were going out of town you know Breaking Bad was all shot around Albuquerque and even you know even the prop houses were having to do it um, some prop houses tried to open out in Albuquerque, and a lot of the prop houses have branches in Atlanta, and some of the prop houses have branches in New York or Vancouver, and you just have to keep keep your eyes open and keep learning. Well, and know what your priorities are. I mean, did you yeah. feel like you had to give something up, like you you're saying you're on uh, one direction? But, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And oh. You uh, just I, had to. There after, isn't a way around it. Unless you were just having a nanny come with you everywhere, right? Well, and it's when I was when I was married, when my son was little, you know, I could not go be an assistant on a movie in Atlanta. I just could not. You know? And I, I didn't make enough money to bring someone with me, you know, it's not that kind of money. Yeah. And um, it just, you know, I was super, I was super lucky. One of my, one of my friends who, she and I were both shoppers, which is like assistant decorator. Sometimes you actually get called assistant decorator and you have more responsibilities and I've done that. Or some people just call you shopper, you might have the same responsibilities. but. Um, a friend of mine, when I was pregnant, she had been working on a TV show that shot at Paramount. I mean, seriously, the closest, and I lived even closer then, the closest prop house. I could get there in six minutes at 6 a.m. in the morning. I could get there, if I left the house at 20 or 6, I could get coffee <laughs> on Larchmont and get to work in time. And a friend of mine was shopping on a TV show, and she called me. She goes, I'm going to go work on a feature out of town you should come interview and do this job because it's perfect for you. I was like six months pregnant and I did that. I worked with that decorator on jobs in town until I finally decided I had to get my decorating card because they were getting to be fewer and fewer. That's when the big TV jobs were really fleeing town for the tax incentives. and. I, you know, there would my, be fewer slots open. There were fewer slots open, and I found myself. I, I think the decision came. I found myself working on a show through a weird circumstance that I did not foresee. That was kind of a dumb circumstance. I found myself working for someone who had done five shows, and like I had done five shows as a production assistant. And so, like, this woman who was 10 years younger than me, who had done five shows, and I didn't like working with her. And, and, it, and 
I was like, this is the point at which I need to get my decorator car because I would be a better decorator than this person I'm working with and I don't want to find myself in this position again. So it was, it was kind of a slog to get my decorator car. I did a lot of commercials and doing commercials you have to get four times as, or back then, you had to get four times as many qualifying days. So I had to get 120 qualifying days on commercials than if a TV show started non-union and white union or a movie started non-union and white union. And I got up to like, I got it's up in the process. 60s. It's such a process. It's not like if someone were listening to this and they wanted to come and be... It's not like you go and you write a check and you're a decorator now. Right. Or you apply for the job and you get it. No. It's a whole... No. And, but, it's just, yeah. but then, on the other hand, when I started as a set dresser... Back oh, we forgot was, to explain that. Uh, well, <laughs> set dresser is that, yet another... A set dresser, set dressers work for me. Okay. Set dressers... And that's not an assistant. That's still something different. That's not an assistant. A set dresser... So, a set dresser rides in the truck. A set dresser is hired by a lead man. The lead man is like my technical... <laughs> we have to make a flowchart. My chart. technical... <laughs> it's, it's kind of a flowchart. It but, is. Uh, the, I, the production designer is my boss. <laughs> and I, where's the producer? Above the... Okay. <laughs> Above that. Okay. Above that. But, yeah, but um, the, a set dresser is a person who they show up at work and they can pick up things and they know how to work uh, screw guns and hopefully they know how to rewire a lamp and they know all kinds of tricky ways to hang pictures and uh, they can take things apart and put them back together. We all need set dressers. <laughs> In life. <laughs> we all need set dressers. Oh my god, set dressers. <laughs> but they need to get there. You know what? A really good set dresser. I have some people who I've worked with my crews who amaze me. They should be, you know, nuclear scientists. They're so clever and good at so many things. But um, the set dresser shows up at work, gets told, you're getting on this truck, and here's a list of the things you're going to go pick up and they go from prop house to prop house to prop house and they pick up all the stuff and then they get it all in the truck and they pad it and they tie it off and are know. people getting paid enough for this we didn't i don't want to ask you to disclose anything but is there like a range of yeah it's a, a per range. day there's, rate well of like dresses, let's say the best dressers. most well known to someone starting out yeah non-union set dressers get a per day rate and they probably don't get paid enough unless they're just i would i have the theory what would that be like uh like maybe 250 a day but that could be a 14 hour day yeah so, so broken into hours, not very much. Riding in a truck, in the heat, in the dirt. I mean, the set dressers go in, oh my God, we just, I was working on that show where we were shooting in Pomona, and we were supposed to shoot like a, a weird, you're supposed to go in and be terrified and not know what's going on, and it's supposed to look like kind of a filthy, weird torture slash sex dungeon. And, oh my God. <laughs> And, and then there's that. And then there's that. <laughs> which I've done those before. That's not a problem. But um, what we put in it was not the problem. But the set dressers have to go in. And I'm like, this place is full of rat and other animal poop. And, like, you know, oh, yeah. my set dressers and I. Not decorated, real. <laughs> like, we're real, remnants like of. Like, hantavirus. Ugh. The set dressers are always going in and. On lower budget things, it's always filthy. You know, if you're on a big budget project, you say to the producers when you scout it, this needs to be cleaned before we go in. And when you say that on a low budget show, they're like, okay, okay. And you get there and it hasn't been. And you're calling the location manager and saying, this place is full of rat poop and we can't do this. I mean, like the set dressers kind of sometimes get pushed to do it but I, i'm like i know when the actors walk in and they're like we can see the dust in the air and who knows what's in this dust be it mold or whatever and you know sometimes the decorator has to fight those fights too never i think never a dull moment 
not yeah, it's not dull. <laughs> dull it's not. I go back to my earlier statement. <laughs> like the stories that you must have. Well, I do want to, as we're, we're wrapping up a little, um, I just think, I want, what would you, I wouldn't say what would you advise, but in a way. I mean, how do you deal with the freelance part of this and the uncertainty because you said you have to get used to it? How do you get used to it? I, I watched a lot of people when I was in my 20s. There's because, really quick, it's not like once you're in the industry that the work just keeps flowing and that you're guaranteed. It, I mean, it does. you're connected, but, change. but your relationships have to stay together. It's, you have to call and start drumming up potential leads or, as one show winds down. Or, or the people you have relationships with have to keep working. I mean, right. I've worked for people who've just decided I'm done. Or because very often they're inviting you into the job. They invite me in, and and I love that. And I've worked for years working for the same people, and but then they start getting jobs they really want to do in Albuquerque or whatever. Or you know, you do a pilot with someone and you love working with them, and you have a great like creative rapport with them, and you like them as a person. And then they go do a job in Albuquerque. He's like, do you want to come to Albuquerque? Or, you know, I've worked with people who are like, do you want to go to Romania? <laughs> and I'm like, the, I got my decorator card on a show with people who then shop their next show in Romania. And I'm like, yes, but can you wait until 2024 when my son, <laughs> well, no. We're almost there. 2021, <laughs> when my son is done with high school. <laughs> but, um. So how do you how do you how did you build that muscle to be okay with it? Because you are a single mom, and certainly you um, and your ex husband share in parenting. But the responsibility of your family is on you, and how do you manage um, that? Well, some of the times you're okay with living on your credit cards a little bit, and you don't like. I haven't had a real. I've been to visit my parents, but I haven't had a real vacation in. I don't know, forever. Because you, know? you have to be ready to go. You can well, have time off, but... it's not the ready to go. It's the when I have time off, I'm not making any money. Yeah. And I can't... Risk um, it. I can't say, I want to go to Rio, Rio de Janeiro and go visit this painter in her studio and go see her paintings for real and wherever she sells them there. Or I want to go to New York and take my son to all the museums because I can't, you know, drop that couple grand because I might need it in two months to pay the mortgage. You know, like, you always hope you finish a job with some money at the bank, but I don't have, you know, a big pad. And It's because you don't know how long those gaps might be. You don't be. know how long those gaps are going to be. I mean, I, when I was a shopper, I remember once... I, in three years, I have a week off. And it's really hard when the work comes and comes and comes to turn it down, too. And at least, as I get older, at least I can say, and I, I remember on those shows, there were people who would say, I have this time off, you know. This show is gonna take us all the way into May of next year, and in February, I have a personal commitment that I will not be available for. But now, you know, I'm kind of working my way into the single camera world and my jobs are shorter. They last for a smaller amount of time and it's harder to do that. I mean, my nephew graduated from high school um, and it was at the beginning of one of my last jobs and it was really hard to take a day off because it was in a very busy time of the show. I mean, that whole show was busy. But it was really hard to take a, a day off, but it was really important. And it just made my job that much more complicated. So you just have to, you just have to decide you're okay with it. I mean, when I was in my 20s, I knew a lot of people who figured out they weren't okay with it. You know, they wanted to get married and buy a house and have kids. And they wanted to feel financially secure. And, you know, a lot of my friends who went into more conventional careers, have a big 401k, and 
they might have more than one house now, and they they have a lot more stability, but not all of them. You know, yeah, does. and we don't always know. Sometimes and all of know, that's an illusion, know. and you never know. But you feel fulfilled in yeah. Like I love you, my job. You I love have, going to work. You have followed. You have followed your heart and your instincts mm -hmm. and your. And I would do it again. Yeah, I would do it again. And that's worth it. Yeah, that's totally For, worth in it. my opinion. No, that it's is worth totally it. worth it. And you're, you know, you're living a good life in LA. It's just maybe. <laughs> I well, have, I think so. I, yeah, I still have holes in my walls because my house was a boarding house because that's what it, that's what I can well, We afford. are set decorating it. It's in process, in progress. It's super in process. For the past eight years, it's been in process. But I do still have holes in my walls and I have weird stuff going on and I have things I haven't painted. And, and but I think a lot of us can say that, right? There's always nice something. <laughs> Your house is done when you bought it, but your house is a house. <laughs> <laughs> it's all, it's, they're it's all, a off. They're, well, they're all choices, yeah. and it's really, I mean, in a way, what would you, uh, what, well, not in a way, what would you advise someone who says, yes, I want to be in the industry, mm -hmm. maybe it's set decoration, maybe mm -hmm. it's something else, is there one thing or that you would tell them? Well, if, if they were young, like if they were just getting out of school, I would say work on every student film you can because there's always something to learn and all that stuff will help you get better when you find someone to pay you. Work as much for free as you can because you're not going to get paid jobs in the beginning unless you know someone and you're super lucky. Um, you know, and wait tables on the side, which you did. <laughs> uh, wait tables on the side, I don't know. Wow. Or temp, I tempt a lot. Once I, I, I didn't wait tables much after I was outside of school, but I tempt. Um, but work with as many people as you can and always remember you don't know who that person's dad is. Because that person might not say anything. <laughs> Only they, in this episode, you don't know who that person's dad no, it's is. It's totally true, true. In, in life in general, even, really. Even but like, here, especially, right? I it's walked into small. the production office. I, I did a show like a year ago, and it was it was kind of a factor of the show, but all the 20-year-olds and the 25-year-olds in the production office were miserable. And it was kind of like, that was the flavor of the show. And they were just you know, unhappy, and you didn't want to deal with them, but you needed them to do things for you. And you couldn't treat them like they were little grumps because you don't know how they got their job. You don't know if their dad ran the network. Seriously. Happen. Or their mom ran the network. Or whatever, you know. And when you get started, uh, be willing to work for free because I, I seriously, I got like, five years of continual work from a free job where some of the people who were doing it were like young associate producers and I did this little movie. The, the one guy was an associate producer on a TV show and uh, he recommended me to so many people. He was, he was a super cool guy. He's actually he was a painter also, and now he's painting. He's living with a rainbow painting. <laughs> and he was a super cool guy, and, um, but he was really, you never know, just work. It, it's, it's both getting experience and meeting people, because you never know. Everybody's coming up at the same time. And somebody who, you know, like, I'm trying to think of people I know. There are people who work in video effects houses now that I did student films with. There are people who are editors that I did student films with. You know, you never know who's going to become what, and you never know. It might not be you, but it might be somebody you know who lands a big break, or somebody they know gives them a job and then says, we need production assistance. And they're like, I'll call my friend Karen. And and she gets to get super lucky and get a job with someone that leads to something. So don't, you know, don't have this like line drawn out in your head. It's 
You never know the future. You never know what's going to become of something. Yeah, it's Notice them, you know. You know, if you can swing it, if you can afford to work for free, you know, I would, you know, hedge your bets, try to do UCLA and USC and AFI student films for free. Not. But you never know. Or NYU. With maybe or NYU or, or whatever. University of Michigan, University of Texas, all these places. But you never know because, you know, I was just doing a show that these two dudes from North Carolina had a little video web show that they did in North Carolina somewhere. And they got so popular on the internet that now they're in Hollywood making a TV show. Yeah. And well, now it's just like... The possibilities are endless. It's just the all the wide open, and we don't even bigger. know where that's going. And the fact that you said Facebook, you know, that's yes, my world. I'm I in the online a space. That they're show doing for Facebook now. shows. A scripted show for Facebook. You think there, it also means there would be more opportunity and just possibilities. There, are, there are more things. But there is a reason I always like that saying: be nice to everyone on your way to the top, because they'll be the same people you see on your way That's to totally the bottom. True. So it's That's totally true. not that we're wishing that people go to the and bottom, but it is important to. It's just good. And it's good advice you know, all the way around. I'm Being a kind enough. person is nice. It's a nice thing to do. It's totally true, and I'm old <laughs> enough. I know people who. I know people who are my age who, you know, their bodies are giving out, even in set decorators, it's rough on you. And and people who are having other, you know, other health issues besides like their knees or their hips going out. I mean, I know people ten years older than me who've had their hips replaced because of the work they do. The it's physical. Set dressers, it's physically really hard. Yeah. And between the standing and the lifting and the moving things, I know people have destroyed their backs, but you know, the people who are nice try to help the people when they get older. It's like, oh, you know, that guy can't ride around on a truck all day and move sofas a million times, but they could work in a prop house yeah. where there's not, I mean, there's a lot of lifting, but maybe there's more shoving than lifting, or they can organize the hand props or be the guy with the, the scan gun who checks things out, you know, and, and there are a lot of people who like a set dressers, need those jobs between the time when they're 55 or 60 and now, you know, my age, I think it's 67 before you can get Social Security. And they need to get as many union hours as possible so that they can afford to live once they retire. We did, you did like a lower rate on set dresser, but just oh. to complete that thought, what would, what can um, someone realistically aim for? Uh, as a set dresser or decorator or it, well decorators that? on big movies decorators on big movies they couldn't negotiate their own rate anymore and I don't even know I mean if you're a really really big decorator doing really big movies and working most of the year probably I don't even, I don't even know I know I can work, if I work most of the year, it's over $100,000 a year somewhere, and a big decorator, I'm assuming probably at least 150, but that's working a lot on a big project. That's your 60 hour. That's, well, decorators work on a flat. If I work 90 hours, if I... If I... So it's just a fee and you just have to do what you need to do. You have to do what you need to do. If it's ridiculous and if you're working for sane people and you say, I have to work through the weekend. They're like, yes, I see that you do and that's rational. Work through the weekend. You'll get paid for Saturday and Sunday. Then you get more. But, um, you know, and then sometimes you work for insane people who... (laughs) <laughs> prove that and try to not pay you for it and, and that still goes on and stuff and and you know I hate to ask and it's like you know I'm going to go run to Ikea for an hour today and it's a Sunday and it's a Sunday, Sunday and I'm not I'm not asking to be paid for it because I'm going to trade that for not working a 14 hour day tomorrow so I can take my kid to school 
Mm-hmm. So I could see him. Yes. Yeah. So wait. <laughs> and I, to me, that's totally fair. I spend fair. a little bit of time on the weekends so I can, you know, eat dinner with my child. And that's a fair trade off for me. Well, is there anything that you would want to share or add to, the, to what we talked about today? Oh, I don't know. I mean, if you love, like, if you're a hunter gatherer and you just love details and you love research, I, I think my job is a great thing to do. It's really hard. And, it, and it's really hard, you know, my parents all the time are like, when are you going to come see us? <laughs> and, and, you know, my deal is I don't have a vacation from June 15th through July 1st for sure. Every year. Every year. And it's not just you that has to learn to deal with the freelancedness of it. It's everyone in your life. You know, my parents are still like, do you know when you're coming for Christmas? And I'm like, you know, and, and other people rely on you to be parts of their lives and sometimes it's hard. You know, I mean, my dad is going in for surgery next week, and thank goodness my niece and my nephew are there, and my dad has a really big support group, and I'm going to have a really, really concerned day because it's a week before shooting and on my show, and it's the, like the worst time to go. Yeah. And, and I'm like really nervous about it. But, you know, it's also, I trade it for, I love what I do for a living, and I don't want to do something for my life that I don't love, and it's just really hard that way. Yep. So, it's a big, big trade That's a lot of creative, for, you know, we talk about it through different professions with the series, it's, it's just a a lot of us have made certain choices in that way. And and then life is just life. Life and is life. Just don't know, but and I know. can't do this on my time frame. You know, I can't yeah. say I'll get all the work done before then, and then get done when I get back because we start shooting on X day, and I have X amount of prep days. And yeah, there's a, a lot of people involved. There's a lot of people involved, and it's not my schedule; it's their schedule. But. You get a fulfilled life, and that is. I have a fulfilled <laughs> life, and I love my job, and I'm super lucky. I I know a lot of people who don't love their job. I lo- almost always like to go to work in the morning. I've, there have been a few shows where I'm like, oh god, when is this show going to end? I've been I've been on shows where we're on the stage, and the network calls the producers and says we're picking it up for four more episodes, and the whole crew goes. No, <laughs> you know, for many different reasons. Oh, well, on that note, <laughs> we will end but, this but I'm one. Not show now. I, love, I love my job. We will end it, and I will say thank you, Karen, for sharing and Absolutely. being here. <laughs> you know where to find me. I'll take your prop house. We'll get a prop house. Yes, we'll show you prop houses. That'll be fun. Okay. That's super fun. Okay.